Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Today's episode, I'm here with Nate Maslach, the co-founder and CEO at Ribbon Health. How are you today? Good, Jared. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you on. Spoke with uh, your team a few weeks ago, got to learn obviously more about the company, uh, but this is the first opportunity that you and I get to talk and I'm really excited to hear more about Ribbon Health directly from you. I'd love you could start things off by sharing with the audience a little bit about your background and then we'll talk more about Ribbon Health. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, so my background, I was born in Russia and I moved to Cleveland when I was eight years old, grew up in the Midwest. I was a Midwest kid through and through, went to college at Wash U. My first job was at McKinsey in Chicago. So I spent a lot of time there. While I was at McKinsey, I was focused primarily on healthcare customers or healthcare clients and was really focused around helping them transition to value-based care. So coolest thing that we did that we can talk about publicly was helping redesign and rebuild a state Medicaid payment system in Arkansas and really thinking about um, how do we better treat people with schizophrenia and how do you just provide value-based incentives to drive that treatment? And it really got me hooked on how do you make healthcare better? How do you have global scalable impact? Um, the thing that I wasn't as excited about was the fact that I felt like we could have been doing a lot more with technology than we were at the time. And I think McKinsey's come a long way and how they're thinking about it. But in 2013, I don't think we were there yet. So I left McKinsey um, after a couple of years. I joined a tech startup called Data Logics, which is a predictive analytics company in the advertising space. Uh, right after the Series A, like right around the stage that, that Ribbon is at now, and we helped kind of build and launch one of our new business and product lines called the Identity Graph, which is very relevant to what we do at Ribbon today. And that company got acquired by Oracle after a few years there. It was an amazing experience, a great outcome. And I didn't know what to do with my life. Um, I knew I didn't want to stay at Oracle. I knew I wanted to get back into healthcare, but I didn't know how. So kind of took pause. I just got into business school, so it felt like it was a good time to go. And it was very fortuitous because in the second month of business school, I met my now co-founder, Nate Fox. Um, so we started what eventually became Ribbon Health in business school and have been at it ever since. And I'm happy to talk about that journey and anything else that's relevant. Yeah, that was a great intro. Thank you so much. I, I want to shift focus now because it kind of ties into your, yeah. your background is talk us through why, why is something for, for those that are, are not familiar, right? Talk, talk to us about what exactly Ribbon Health does and then why, I guess, yeah, well, let's go the opposite way. Why you decided to, to start this and obviously business school. And then let's even talk about maybe why you decided to continue um, yeah. a, after, after working on it. And then also how do things currently work today and what exactly the company does for those that aren't familiar with the company? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll start with the why start ribbon. Um, I think like a lot of folks in the healthcare space, um, it started with kind of a personal journey. Um, actually, for both my co-founder and me, and I don't think we'd be here today without both of those journeys happening. Um, for me, it was more of a negative journey. So my mom was really struggling to navigate the healthcare system and, and everything is fine. But I think the, the watching the process was very eye-opening. So she started to have joint pain um, about five or six years ago and wasn't really sure what to do, but it was becoming a real problem. And I grew up in Cleveland. So one of the major healthcare hubs in the world. I was at McKinsey Chicago doing healthcare work. So really nearby and was very connected in the space. And I went to Wash U, which means that a lot of my friends ended up going to medical school or being doctors. And so about as privileged of kind of a plugged in care navigation consumer as I could possibly be. And I struggled to help her navigate her healthcare. So we called in some favors, figured out who's the best um, joint pain provider in Cleveland, routed it, got ahead of the appointment queue, did everything that you can think of like happening in a privilege system. And then that wasn't a joint pain provider. It was a back pain doctor who then referred my mom to a knee pain doctor and then an elbow doctor and then a surgeon, but she didn't need surgery and all these MRIs and tests. And six months later, thousands of medical, um, thousands of dollars of medical bills. And my mom still didn't know what was wrong and was kind of nearing a really tough financial situation. And she pulled out of the system. And it's still hard for me to nudge her to go to a doctor when something is wrong. Um, that's, that's not how healthcare should operate. Um, and especially kind of coming from the place of privilege that I was coming from in this setting, it was really eye-opening. 
on the other side, um, when I was kind of complaining to, to my co-founder, also named Nate, about this, um, he had kind of shared his personal story. So, so Nate was born clinically deaf and his family was able to kind of realize that early. They were able to navigate the system. They were able to get all the resources. And, and somebody who was born and couldn't hear now can hear. Now you, nobody would have kind of any idea. And the stark contrast of what those two journeys were like I think was really eye-opening for both of us to understand like how could the system operate and what do we need to do? So that was the overall kind of initial moment. And so we started out as a care navigation company. We said, what, what can we do to help people not have to go through this experience and not have to go through it alone? So we built a care navigation solution. We started selling it into employers. And when folks started using the product, they started complaining that when they called the doctor, the phone number was wrong. The address was wrong. The doctor was out of network. There were doctors who hadn't practiced in years. There were doctors who had passed away 15 years ago in our system. And we were just kind of using what everybody else used to use before Ribbon came along, um, MPEZ. And we later found out that that was less than 50% accurate. So we started building our own data solution, um, kind of with some borrowed learnings of what we had done in our past careers. And all of a sudden we started to see that accuracy go up and our member base be a little bit happier, but still disgruntled because it wasn't hundred percent accurate. But as we started to make more noise about that in market, some of our competitors actually started coming out asking, where are you finding this? And when we'd say we're building it, they would say, can we license it? And for us, our vision as a company has always been from day one and will always be to power every care decision to be convenient, cost-effective, and high quality. And we felt like we could have much broader and faster impact if we were to kind of help enable all of these companies. So we didn't size the market. We didn't do the things that you're supposed to do if you want to be a venture-backed company. We built an API and we launched it. And we started working on that product. And the more time we spent the market, the more we realized that this is a massive problem. And it wasn't just a handful of care navigation platforms that were struggling with it. It's health insurance companies, it's hospitals and provider groups, it's digital health tools, it's patients. Anytime anybody gets sick, anytime that anybody needs to make a care decision, you need information on the source of care delivery, primarily the provider. And yet we as an industry have been comfortable with provider directories that are 48% accurate um, we are comfortable with people going out of network. We're comfortable with people having no idea how cost effective um, or how high quality a provider is. And so we felt like we needed to go after that. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, out of every guest we've ever had on this podcast, understanding exactly the problem you're solving is one that you know I'm, I'm very familiar with through, through yep. like Block Health, right? And that's why it was also really cool to have you on here. Um, to, to talk more about that because I'm with you. We, we deal with those pains too, right? Like even some of the databases we, cause we're, we're on the kind of operational side of like completing the different actions, right? The licenses, yep. the enrollments and things like that. And yes, we're with you with the, there, these it's uh 40% sometimes is probably being generous uh, yeah. too, because <laughs> like, they're just like garbage. Um, you look at like, you know, it's not everything on the internet is trustworthy. Right. But there's such a higher level of certainty with different data sets that are publicly available, but these, these directories have just long suffered. So I, I was really excited to, to see what you were building and then also the, the future potential collaborations, right? That we can both help yeah. each other move forward. So super interesting. Can you talk me through, because obviously this has been a problem for a while. Why now, like why, why now is the right time to kind of fix this provider data problem through your eyes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the right time to fix the provider data problem would have been when we started building provider databases all together. Um, but I understand how healthcare evolves and we have a lot of empathy for how we got to this point. I think why now, um, or at least why it's feasible to be able to solve this now is because there's more information out there than there ever was before. I think we've seen just the huge proliferation of consumerism in healthcare. And I know we've talked about it as an industry for over a dozen years, but it really does feel like we're here. And if you, I don't know, go into any search engine and type in a doctor's name, you're gonna see 20 different websites that have that doctor on that. And so there's all this data that's living out there and yet it's super conflicted. And over the last five years, just the proliferation of analytical technology and machine learning technology to really be able to solve these problems quickly and at scale has enabled us to start to build a foundation for it. 
I think the other piece is that we've seen a lot of really important innovations happen around like cost and quality analytics and really like important parts of the value chain but you can't actually drive a cost-effective referral if you have no idea where that doctor practices. If I think you're at your private practice, but actually you got gobbled up by the most expensive hospital system in the state, if I steer you there, even though you're a cost-effective surgeon, that facility fee is going to be really high. And I think we kind of got to this place where healthcare needed that infrastructure. And people started to think about the provider directory problem, not as a phone number problem, but a problem that impacts every part of the healthcare workflow, credentialing, can the doctor actually see patients there? And then like, can the patient find them? And then you get to earn the right to say, and are you cost effective at that location? I wanna quickly shift focus, Nate, to another area that we wanted to talk about today. And this is, this is more about the, the ribbon product too, not, not just the problems you're, you're solving. Yep. This is a new product that you recently released, right? Called, uh, I, I think you call it focus areas. Yep. Can, can you talk a little bit more about what that product is and, uh, and, and also because because the gist of it from what you've explained to me is it allows people to know, like patients allow them to know more of what their doctor uh, is doing. Right. So and let's, let's answer that question, but then also tack a part two to it. And why is it important for patients to even know uh, what their doctor does? Yeah. 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 So Focus Harris is a product that, as you put it, provides a little bit more information to the patient, but also to other providers and to health insurance companies, to the entire ecosystem, to kind of help tag, what does a doctor really focus on? And an example that I think about a lot is behavioral health or mental health. If I go to a health plan website and I say, help me find a behavioral health provider, I don't actually know if the provider that I'm finding is somebody who specializes in the treatment of clinical acute schizophrenia, or if there's somebody who really focuses on anxiety or couples counseling, those are very different providers. And in order to match a patient and their needs to that provider, it's important for the patient or whomever to know what that provider focuses on and focus areas. And I think just tying it back to the founding story of the company, it's something that's personally near and dear to my heart because I think of the journey that my mom went through and other people go through all the time where they just get lost and there's little things that we can start to help provide to the industry that can start to solve that problem so a patient doesn't have to wonder am i going to a hip replacement surgeon for a knee replacement surgery and am i going to waste all this time and waste the provider's time too before i get routed to the right point in care and how how new is this this new product that you rolled out it is, it is hot off the presses. Uh, we just announced it a couple of weeks ago. This is the first time I'm talking about it in this kind of environment. So momentous occasion for, for us here at Riven. Love it, love it. Let, <laughs> let's, let's, let's wrap things up a little bit by talking a little bit more about Ribbon in terms of talk about the culture a little bit. And also what are your hiring plans moving forward? Are there open positions that people can go and check out? So I'd love to hear more about that before we wrap up. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you asked. It's uh, something that's really important to us. So we're a very values-driven environment. And when we think about our culture, we think about our six core values and how we can live those together as, as a group. At the end of the day, um, similar to Black Health and Ribbon and any other company, it's about people. It's people building things. It's people distributing things to be able to drive towards that mission. And so we think so much about the human beings who are with us every day and how we can make this the best career decision that they have ever made and provide them with that kind of learning and that development so that they continue to feel excited and motivated about what they do. So um, that's how we think about people here at Urban. We are absolutely hiring. I believe we have over 30 open roles at the company right now. We're about 50 people. We were 18 people when the year started and just have big plans to keep growing. Um, as you know, we're, we're biting off a pretty big uh, slice of the problem. And so it requires a lot of amazing, exceptional human beings to help us solve it. Well, I look forward to, to staying in touch with you and hopefully having you on again soon and to continue here about Ribbon's, uh, Ribbon Health's progress. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. This has been fun.